everyone and welcome to OTOG. This is an opportunity for you to study the OT with me and OG. My name is Judy Fentress Williams and I am so delighted to be with you all tonight doing the thing I love to do most which is study the Bible. Now since our last session there were a couple of questions about the name of our program OTOG and the saints of God understood the OT part but they wanted to know about OG. I'm so glad you asked. OG is original gangster. It's a term that we borrow from hip hop culture. It essentially means old school. And the reason we use it is because when I earned my PhD in 1999 from Yale University, I was the first African American woman to earn that degree from Yale. That happened 10 years after Dr. Renita Weems was the first African-American woman in this country to earn a PhD in Old Testament from Princeton Theological Seminary. In that 10-year period, there were not a whole lot of us. And so we want to take the time to recognize every single OG, every single person who made a way by opening doors and breaking down barriers our scholarship, our understanding of the Bible is better because of all of them. So at the end of this show, as we will do at the end of every show, we will do a little roll call and say the names of some of them who have opened the door for us. Let's do a little recap of our Bible study from last week. Last week, I talked about the fact that the Bible has a complicated composition history. In other words, it comes to us by a circuitous path. But I also affirm that the Bible is inspired, that it is God's word. And I want us to take these two things, the inspiration of God's word and a complicated composition history, and hold them together, even if that means holding them together in tension. We don't have an original Bible. We have various manuscripts that we then translate. But in spite of that, God's Holy Spirit speaks through that text. Think about the spirit in an earthen vessel. Think about what it means for the spirit to be embodied. Some of you know what it's like to be in church when the Holy Spirit is really, really high. And it seems like everybody in the sanctuary is moved by the spirit. One spirit, many bodies, but not everyone responds in the same way. Some people just shout, the shouters. You have the people who just clap their hands. You have the people who quietly weep because they're overcome by the goodness of God. And then you have the people who are so holy that they don't move at all. One spirit, many, many, many manifestations. And if we're honest... If we're wise, we would want to say that is proof that that is an authentic manifestation of the Spirit. If everybody behaves the same way, somebody is faking it. So if we can acknowledge that openness when we see people respond to God's Spirit, that embodiment of the Spirit, why do they, we then want to like insist that there's only one way for God, God's Spirit to speak through the text? Why do we narrow it down so that people are not open to seeing truth in more than one form in Scripture? The Bible is inspired and uses multiple voices over time and different perspectives all together to proclaim a truth that is larger than any single person's understanding. The Bible is a dialogic text. 
I want to promote a hermeneutic, and remember, hermeneutic is a way of interpreting scripture. I want to promote a hermeneutic that acknowledges and embraces a variety of meanings in scripture, that we can have more than one consciousness around this text, that a dialogic approach means there's more than one good way to go, more than one good answer. And my favorite word around this is what we call unfinalizability, that the truth of God's word keeps opening up in front of us. Think about those infomercials. You know, the ones that come on TV, they're trying to sell you something that's amazing. And they spend about 12 minutes telling you why you have to have the chop o or why you have to get these knives or why you need this substance to clean all of your surfaces. And right before they get to the end, they'll say something like, but wait, there's more. That's when they want to sell you on some little extra thing that you can get of course, for additional shipping and handling. But there's this sense when you're watching an infomercial that whatever they're saying isn't the whole thing. That's the attitude I want you to have when you read scripture. And understanding that you're getting a lot of good, but there's always something just beyond us that we may get the next time we visit that text. And that that expectation in us never, ever goes away. So... We're going to look at a passage of scripture tonight in 2 Kings. And before we do, I want to just do a little bit more of a recap. For those of you who are still trying to find your own way of negotiating this text, if you're looking for your own hermeneutic, here are the three rules I want to recommend that you use. Rule number one, stop reading the Bible like you've been saved your whole life. Stop acting like you know all the answers before you open up the text. Be open to the possibility that there's something you've never seen before or that you've never seen it in that way. The second thing I want you to do is practice reading the scripture aloud. Try it from different translations. Try it sitting down and standing up. The more you read aloud, the more open you are to recapturing some of the oral tradition. This is where we discover that sometimes things were said a certain way for the purpose of repetition, or perhaps because it is the way that it's said is going to point in some way to what the text is trying to communicate to you. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, I want you to look at this text with a sense of wonder and bring your imagination. One of the things I love about the way we teach our young children through a program called Godly Play is that it uses and repeats the words, I wonder. It's a way of training people to be open to the possibilities. And that's what I want us to do when we look at the text today. Lessons from last week would come from our Study of creation in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, where we looked at two different stories and looked at the way in which the context of the Israelites at the time the story came into its final form had a lot to do with the way that they told the story. The people who were recording this text knew what happened. They knew what happened on day one. They knew what happened on day two. They knew what happened on day three. So they weren't telling the story so that people would know what happened. They wanted us to know something about the God who made it happen. Realize that the creation story for the Israelites would have been a well-rehearsed story so that whenever someone got up and started by saying, in the beginning when God, everybody knew what was going to come next. It's like when you're in church and it's your choir that's singing. And not only is it your choir, but then your soloist gets up. And before he or she even says the first word, you're all ready to shout because you know what they are going to say. That's what it is like for people who are in an oral tradition who know the story of creation. Here's the story where I am reminded of a God who is almighty and powerful. 
Or here's the story where I'm reminded of a God who is personal and intimate and cares about the details of my life. Each story has a function in the life of the community, not simply because of what it says, but because of how it is said. With that in mind, let's look at our scripture passage in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Now the wife of a member of the company of prophets came to the prophet Elisha and said, your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know your servant feared God. But now a creditor has come to take my sons away as slaves. Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? She said, your servant has nothing except a little oil. He said, go out and borrow vessels from all of your neighbors, empty vessels and not a few, and then go in and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into each of these vessels, and when each one is full, set it aside. So she went out and closed the door behind her and her two sons. They brought her containers, and she kept on pouring. When the last one was full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said, there are no more. Then the oil stopped flowing. So she went and told the man of God, and he said, go and sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on the rest. One of the things that we want to do before we begin working on the text is talk a little bit about exegesis. Exegesis is a Greek word that means to draw out. In other words, when we encounter scripture, after we read it, we want to intentionally do the work of making sure we bring all of, the, um, all of the background, all of the history, all of the language work that's at our disposal, the best of what we have, to open up and come to an understanding of this text. This is a big part of the reason that you come to Alfred Street Baptist Church. Hear me now. We undoubtedly have one of the greatest preachers that this nation has ever seen. He is a gifted and anointed preacher, but he also does the work to honor the gift. And every preacher who gets in this pulpit is not coming up here just because they have some gift in the execution of a sermon, but because they have done the work of understanding, interpreting, and opening up a text. This is why we come. And this is something we all need to get in the habit of doing ourselves. So when we look at this text in 2 Kings, we want to set it within its context. I want to talk a little bit about the historical context of this text. This book, Kings, is a part of something called the Deuteronomistic History. The Deuteronomistic History includes the books of Joshua, Judges, Samuel and Kings, and no, I didn't forget Ruth. Ruth belongs in another collection. Joshua Judges, Samuel and Kings are books that give us uh, a narrative arc of the Israelites coming into the land of promise, establishing a nation and a monarchy, that nation dividing into two, and then the eventual demise of both. So from Joshua to Kings, we have a narrative arc of coming in and some establishment of things and then the undoing of a nation. The people who brought together the elements of the Deuteronomistic history were writing about what happened knowing what the end was going to be. Think about this. No matter how many times you go to see the movie Titanic, the ending is always the same. In fact, it's a movie you go to knowing what's going to happen at the end. So the odds are good you're not going to see whether or not the ship is going to make it. You already know it's not. 
you're going to get an idea about the lives of the people who um, got on that ship, who survived, who didn't, and to get into the stories around that. Some people go because they want to rehearse why that tragic um, why that tragedy happened, because they're not convinced that it had to. When we look at the Deuteronomistic history, we are talking about a collection of stories that have been assembled with the end already known. The people are in exile. They know how the story ends. Now they go back to the beginning to try to figure out not just what happened, but why it happened. Spoiler alert, in the Deuteronomistic history, things go badly because people do not worship God exclusively. That's the, that's the quick version of it. When we look at the book of Kings, things are already on a downward spiral. We have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. And the story of kings will go back and forth until the northern kingdom is destroyed by the Assyrians and then the southern kingdom is taken into exile. But we come into the story in kings when we still have these two nations. And the nation of Israel is a player in this larger national construct with Babylon and Assyria and Egypt. In the book of Kings, we see the story of the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, and they're both on a downward spiral. They're set up so that we follow each king in succession. But the book doesn't just tell us about the kings. It has stories of prophets, and the prophets we are looking at today would be Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha are like no other prophets that we've seen in the Bible. They are more action figure than orator. The prophet Elijah is held in high esteem in the Bible. He's like, he's up there with Moses. He heals Naaman. He raises the dead. And if that's not enough, at the end of his life, he doesn't just die like everybody else. He gets taken up in a chariot of fire. Elisha, his son in ministry, his, his, his disciple, does some of the same miracles that Elijah does. And in 2 Kings 4, we have a story about a widow in crisis. Now look at what happens. She comes to Elisha demanding that he help her out. Widows and orphans and aliens would have been the most vulnerable people in Israelite society. Without a husband, this woman has no means of support and is unable to inherit property. Her sons could inherit on her behalf and support her, but because they are in debt, they will be taken away as slaves. The widow comes to Elisha demanding that he do something to fix the situation. And I love what Elisha does here. He asks her, what do you have? Now, she's already coming to him in crisis. You could assume she has nothing. Um, but he pushes against her expression of what's wrong and invites her to think about what she actually does have. All she can think of is a little oil. And what I love is that that little oil is enough. So look at what happens in the story. He tells her to go out to her neighbors and to borrow empty vessels. Those are going to be a part of the miracle. Those empty vessels then get brought into her house where she and her son are going to shut the door, and that's where the miracle happens. This miracle that Elisha is going to work out on her behalf is going to involve the community. She has to go out and borrow from her neighbors. Now, I love this story because it suggests that sometimes the work that God is going to do in our lives is going to involve more than just us. That sometimes we are going to have to be vulnerable to our neighbors. Now, this is hard for some of us saints because some of us do not like letting people know we're in need. 
here's a woman whose husband just died. And maybe the neighborhood doesn't know that her sons are threatened and go, are going to be sold into debt slavery. But the odds are good that at least one person knows. And now she's got to go borrow empty vessels when people know she doesn't have anything. She's got to be vulnerable. All right? So she does... She goes out and borrows. Well, I don't think she goes out and borrows. I think she goes out and sends her sons. That's what I would have done. Y'all go do that. They bring the vessels in, and when they come in, then in private, the miracle happens. As they pour into each jar, and the oil doesn't stop flowing until they are all filled. He then tells her she can sell the oil, and she'll not only have enough to pay off the debt, but that she and the sons can live on the rest. Stay with me, saints. If she had not borrowed enough vessels, maybe she would have only had enough to pay off the debt. Maybe she would have only been able to redeem one son. Instead, she had enough not only to pay the debt, but for their future, to go into their future with security. Here is a miracle that invites everybody who's listening to dream big even when your provisions are small. And when I read this text, my own context causes me to identify with the widow. I identify with the protagonist who is in crisis and goes at to ask for help because I am a wife and a mother and I imagine what it would be like if I were in this situation and my children were in peril. And the story works when I read it this way. The context works, there is a message, there is a truth, and it's good. But wait, because the text is dialogic, there's more. And one of the ways we access that more is to step back and read the text from another perspective. Now, this is really important because most of us tend to occupy the same place when we read the Bible every time. In fact, most of us identify with the victor, the winner, the good guy, all right? Sometimes we're not. Sometimes we're not the disciples. Sometimes we're not Jesus. Sometimes we're not um, the obedient Israelites. And so shifting the point of orientation when you're studying a text can open up new possibilities. What then if we read this story through the lens of the sons? Now think about it. There's only one speaking line for one of the sons in this entire story, and that is, there are no more. Arguably, they are the center of the story, not the mother. They are the ones that would be sold into debt slavery. So imagine then what it is like to be these sons who are acted upon. Their father is gone, and the inheritance they have is one of indebtedness. They are a part of a larger legal system that has gone bad. Now stay with me for a second. As long as we are thinking about this story and reading it through the lens of the widow, we end up with the story of a woman who is in need and her need is met and um, the crisis is averted and praise God, hallelujah. All right, it's a good story. But when we look at the story through the lens of the sons, what happens is that we see the story is not just about her specific situation. When we read it through the lens of the sons, we begin to realize that this is probably not the only family in the neighborhood who is struggling with indebtedness. And when we begin to think that way, it opens up the possibility then that a part of what we want to examine in this story is a culture or a society where debt slavery exists in the first place. Now, this is a little crazy because if you think about it, the Israelites were redeemed from slavery. God brought them out of slavery in the story of the Exodus. You remember that 
Moses, Pharaoh, 10 plagues, the sea splits, all the drama, Prince of Egypt, 10 commandments, all of it. They come through into the wilderness for a very long time. But a part of that time is marked by their receiving the 10 commandments where God gives them this law. They enter into covenant with God. And in the very next chapter, Exodus chapter 21, there are rules about slaves. This is where you want to ask yourself an I wonder question. I wonder how it is that people who used to be slaves are so okay with slavery. I wonder how it is that we went from being enslaved and free to now deciding there are acceptable forms of slavery. There are rules in Exodus that are a part of Israelite culture about how and when people will be enslaved. And the system that is set up gets progressively worse. Amos talks about it in Amos 2, 6 and Amos 8, 6. Amos talks about selling the needy for a pair of shoes. And so the problem that we see in 2 Kings 4 is never just about the widow. It's about a culture or an institution where people get enslaved for debt in the first place. Her redemption doesn't make the situation go away. When we read the story through the lens of the sons, we begin to ask, what about everybody else? This story is not just about one family, and it's not just about one crisis. It's about a system of debt slavery. We begin then to see the importance of moving out of our own narrow perspective so that we can hear other voices around the table so that we begin to push past the first resolution and the first crisis to uncover the greater crisis. Yes, we thank God that the Lord restored that widow. But we shouldn't start shouting so much that we forget to ask ourselves what we are doing to help all the other widows and all the other widows' sons. A dialogic approach to scripture is going to ask you to look for the what's more. To think about looking at that text from somebody else's perspective and begin then to see new truths that open up. I've been thinking a lot about what's been happening in our world today and how much we have to learn from young people who in my mind are committed more to fixing a system than to just saving a few select families. What happens when the main character is not the mother, but the children? These are the kinds of things that we can begin to get when we open up the text dialogically, when we ask questions, and when we wonder. As we close tonight, let's remember the names of those who went before, those biblical scholars who opened doors in Old Testament and New Testament. Dr. Thomas L. Hoyt earned his PhD in New Testament from Duke University. He was elected bishop in the CME church prior to his passing. Dr. Hugh Page received his PhD in Hebrew Bible and Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations from Harvard University and is currently the Dean of Freshman Studies at Notre Dame University. Dr. Aubrey Hendricks earned his PhD in New Testament and Religions of Late Antiquity from Princeton Theological Seminary. Dr. Cheryl Anderson earned her PhD in Hebrew Bible from Vanderbilt University. I hope that this has been a fruitful journey for you, and I hope that we can begin to think about ways that we can open up this text again and again and again. This is Dr. Judy, and I thank you for our time together. I'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.